Welcome to Marlow Baptist Church and thank you for joining us today. For those that are watching and listening may be greatly encouraged by God's Word. We are truly blessed that we can still hear God's Word in these times and may be encouraged today. I take a reading from Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. For in the time of trouble He shall hide me in His pavilion. In the secret place of His tabernacle He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. Let us bow our heads together and let us pray. Our eternal Heavenly Father, we approach your throne of grace, Lord, today. We thank you, Lord, that we can come before you. What a privilege it is for us to approach your throne. You are the Creator, you are the Sovereign God, and we thank you, Lord, for who you are. We thank you, Lord, for your sovereign hand. And especially in these times, Lord, it's very difficult, but we trust you. We trust your plan and purpose. We know that all things ultimately are in your control. But we approach you, Lord, today with thanksgiving and praise for the work that you've done in our lives and for who you are. Thank you, Lord, for salvation. Thank you for saving us. Thank you, Lord, that our salvation is drawing nearer. Thank you, Lord, that we know that despite the difficulties in our world, that we have a hope beyond this world. Thank you, Lord, for that. Help us, Lord, to share that hope with others. Help us to live that hope. Lord, we also want to acknowledge our sin today. We want to confess our sin, acknowledge our shortcomings. And Lord, we know that without you, we are nothing. It is only by your grace that we are saved. It is only by your grace that we live. And Lord, we, we do many things that we shouldn't do. We think many things we shouldn't be thinking. But Lord, it's not just the sins that we commit, but it's the things we fail to do that we should do, that you've commanded us to do. Help us, Lord, to be obedient. Help us to trust you. Help us to obey your word. And Lord, thank you for the forgiveness that we have received, that despite our sin, despite our failures, that you have been gracious to us. Lord, we pray for our church here in Marlow. We pray for your people. We pray that you'll be with us as a church. Bind us together, Lord. We pray, Lord, that in this town of Mount Marlow and the surrounding areas, that we will be a church that is reaching out and sharing the wonderful message of Jesus Christ. We pray for the salvation of souls in our town. We pray for the salvation, Lord, of people. Use us, Lord. Use us as your hands and your feet to reach out. But we pray, Lord, for our church. We pray for those who are struggling at this time. We want to pray, Lord, for, for Keith Ingram. We just pray that you'll be with him and be with Marion and be with the family. We continue to pray for Patrick and Joy. Please be with them, Lord. We also want to pray for, for Christine and Len. And just pray, Lord, that you will, will be with them. Lord, we're also very conscious of Lynette and, and we just pray for her at this time. We just commit her to you. And we also pray for, for Neville and Juanita. Please be with them, Lord. 
We just pray for our church. Pray that we will encourage each other and be there for each other. Lord, we also pray for our world. We pray for the governments in our world. We pray that you will give to them wisdom to make the right decisions at this time. We pray that they will do what is best for people. They will do what is right. Lord, we know that you have put systems of government in place and we trust you lord despite the difficulties at this time especially because there's a distrust often of authority and especially at this time and we pray for the government as you've commanded us to we also pray for what's hap- for america and what's happening in america we pray that there will be peace that there will be calm that there will be responsible people that will do what is right that it will not be about pride and ego but it will be about what is best for the people we know that it's a very complex situation it's not simple so we don't presume to know every detail Lord. we just pray for peace we just pray that, that will not affect the rest of the world So, Lord, we come before you today and we just pray for families who are struggling, who've lost loved ones at this time during this pandemic. And we pray that you will be with the families, be with those who have had to say goodbye to family members. We also pray, Lord, for those who are fearful, those who are struggling, those who are afraid. We pray for those who are confused and discouraged. Please, Lord, be with us at this time. Help us to to go to your word. Speak to us through your word. Encourage us through your word. Because in in you, Lord, we have hope. In your word, we see the bigger picture. Help us to hold on to the promises that you've given to us. We also pray for the church worldwide. And we pray that the church at this time will be salt and light and will be a bastion for truth and for righteousness. Help us, Lord, to love you and love our neighbor. So, Lord, we come before you, Lord, today, and we just commit ourselves to you. We just pray that you'll be with us, strengthen us, and keep us focused. May everything said and done today, Lord, truly bring you honor and glory. In your wonderful name we pray, the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Hello boys and girls, it's lovely having you in the service with us. Today I want to talk to you about salt. Jesus said that God's people are the salt of the earth. I want to take that reading from Matthew chapter 5 verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Why did Jesus say that we as God's people are the salt of the earth? Well, many years ago, people didn't have fridges. So salt was used to stop food from going bad. It was a preservative. Salt was also used to make food taste better. And even salt was used as money to buy things. So salt had many uses. But Jesus here is talking about us as God's people being a preservative. You and I, as those who know God, are there to help others to know who God is, to tell the world what is right and what is wrong and what the Bible teaches. And therefore, we as as Christians, and as God's people, we are like salt. We are helping the world and preserving it by letting the world know what God's will is and what right and wrong is. And that's very, very important. And God uses us to do that. So at school, with our friends, in our families, God helps us to be a preservative in those times in our lives and to help others to know who God is. But I've got a few things here to to show and demonstrate how salt can help the world. So I've got two glasses. I've got two eggs. I've got some water. And I also have some salt. So I'm going to take this water and put it in the glass. There we go. 
So I'm going to take this first glass with just water, and I'm going to take this egg. You can try this at home. You put the egg in, and what you'll see is the egg goes right to the bottom. It sinks when it's got no salt in. Now I'm going to take the second glass of water, and I'm going to put quite a bit of salt in. Don't, don't, don't. Put a lot of salt in. Okay. And then I'm going to put the egg in. Oh, wow. And what you will see is that the egg does not go to the bottom. It actually stays at the top. Because the salt keeps the egg afloat. You'll also see that if you go to Israel ever in your life, you'll see that the Dead Sea has a lot of salt and people actually are drifting at the top of the water because they don't sink, because the water has so much salt in it. Now, what this example is showing us is the fact that when there's no salt in the world, the world will sink. The world will sink into darkness, not knowing what is right and wrong and what God's will is. But when there's a lot of salt in the world, when we as Christians are that salt, what happens is we help the world to not sink, but to float. So that is why in our families, at school, with our friends, always remember that God has called us to be salt, to help, to be a good influence in the lives of our friends and our families. And may we always know that Jesus wants us to be that good influence. Let us look to him, ask him for help, and he will help us to be a good influence. So always remember, be that salt in your life and be salt to everyone around you. See you again next week and thank you for being with us and may you have a wonderful day. We continue our series on the Gospel of Matthew. 
And today we are considering Matthew chapter 5. I've entitled the message, The Beatitudes. Our reading is taken from Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 1 to 20. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whatever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 is what is called the Sermon on the Mount. It is the most well-known sermon containing some of the most well-known verses. These three chapters lay a very important foundation in the teachings of Christ. Jesus preached this sermon on an unspecified mountain. He spoke to his disciples and others who were with him. There must have been a large crowd that gathered to hear Jesus Christ preach. It was a defining moment in the ministry of Christ. Matthew chapter 5 contains 48 verses with so much information, but the key verse is verse 20. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse 3 to 10 is very well known. It is called the Beatitudes. It's probably the most quoted verses in Matthew chapter 5. The word Beatitude means blessed in Latin. Now these verses are very important, but often they are taken out of context because as we read verse 3 to 10, we must see it in the wider context of Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Often these verses are used to the church as a call to social action, that the church must reach out to the poor, to the hungry, to those who thirst and those who mourn. Now while this is very important, it's important for us as the church to be relevant in our communities and to reach out, this passage is not a social manifesto. This passage is not a call to social action. It is about the principle of salvation and the application of salvation in the life of the believer. It is important for us to understand the wider context of what Jesus was saying to those he spoke to. He was highlighting certain dynamics of the Old Testament law and the importance of certain principles. But Jesus Christ was leading people away from doing the physical things of the law to focus on the heart behind the law, to focus on our heart in worshiping God rather than just falling into formula or just religious ceremony. 
Jesus Christ was drawing followers to him who wanted to worship God in spirit and in truth. As we consider Matthew chapter 5, firstly we want to look at godly character. And we see that from verse 3 to 12. To have a truly godly character. Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does it mean to be poor? Jesus Christ was not referring to those who don't have resources, those who are physically poor. Jesus Christ is speaking to those who acknowledge that they are helpless and poor in spirit. Those who are truly acknowledging their need for Christ. That without Christ and without God, they cannot be saved. Those who are acknowledging their hopeless state. As Abraham said, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. Only God provides salvation. Those who understand that, who understand their need, are those who are truly blessed. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. What is the mourning Jesus Christ is referring to here? Jesus is speaking of sorrow and sorrow over sin. Our sorrow over sin in our lives. To be truly contrite in our hearts. To be repentant is what Jesus Christ is referring to. Those who have godly sorrow over their sin is those who are blessed. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 10 says, For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces salvation death. Repentance is very important. It's important in the Christian life for us to live a life of repentance, to acknowledge our sin and to have sorrow over our sin and also over sin in this world. Because sin leads to death and we must have that sorrow. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. What does it mean to be meek? It's those who are humble The meek is the humble, those who are willing to humble themselves before God. The Bible says that God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Blessed are those who humble themselves before the mighty hand of God. And that humility is understanding who we are and who God is. God is above us, therefore we humble ourselves before Him. No matter what position we might hold in this world, no matter what we might think of ourselves, we have to humble ourselves before God. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. What is this hunger and thirst? It's a spiritual desire for God's righteousness. It's a longing for that which comes from the Lord. It's a hunger for the bread of life and a thirst for the living water. It is those who are truly hungering and thirsting after the things of God. Those who don't want to hunger and thirst after this world and the trappings of this world, but those who truly hunger and thirst for the spiritual and the righteousness of God. Those who want their lives to be filled with God and not with this world. That is those who are truly hunger and thirst after the righteousness of God. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. It's a key thought in Christ's ministry when he speaks in parables. He often spoke about those who owe money and that there must be mercy shown. Jesus speaks of the two servants. One owes the master a lot of money and the master forgives him. And then the other servant owes that servant money and he's not willing to forgive. So being merciful was part of what Jesus Christ was teaching. Why? Because when we see ourselves and we understand our own sin and how much God has forgiven us, how can we not then extend that mercy to others? How can we not show mercy to others when we ourselves fall short. God says, love God and love your neighbor. Show that mercy to others. Blessed are those who show mercy, 
because they have received mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. The Bible says in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17, verse 9, that the heart of man is wicked above all things. So whose heart is truly pure? There's no way that a man can have a pure heart. It's only through Christ that we are washed, that we are cleansed, that we are sanctified, that we have any purity. Therefore, those who are pure in heart are blessed, and those are those who, who want less sin and more of God. Those who turn from their sin in their lives and, and long for more of God in their lives. The less sin we have, the clearer God becomes. The less we are blinded by sin, the greater our perception and vision of who God truly is. So those who are pure in heart, who want to have purity in their lives, holiness and righteousness are those who truly will see God. Jesus is also referring to a bigger picture. That those who will stand before the Lord one day have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. And they will stand in purity before God and see God. As Job says, I will see the Lord in my flesh. So what a blessing it is to know that we will see God. And we can see Him in this world. We can see how He works and who He is through His Word and through us turning from our sin. The more we turn from this world, the greater our perception of God will be. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says, Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. A peacemaker in the context here is not someone that tries to avoid conflict. But a peacemaker here is someone that has experienced that peace with God. Knowing true peace starts by knowing God and having that peace with Him. So a peacemaker... Is, is one who walks with Christ, who's experienced that peace, who knows that peace, that lives out that peace, and then, then can also share that peace with others. When we know the peace that comes from God, we can share that message of peace. We are here as ambassadors for Christ. We are here to share a message of reconciliation, to reconcile man to God through the message of Christ. And that brings peace in the lives of people. It's not just the absence of conflict. It's about truly having peace with God. Knowing peace, living that peace, and being at peace. Blessed are the persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs the kingdom of heaven. Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 14 and says, But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. We will be persecuted as God's people in this world. Why? Because this world has rejected God. This world hates God, and therefore we will be hated. But it is a blessing to suffer for Christ. It's a blessing to suffer for righteousness' sake. God is with us in the midst of suffering, in the midst of of persecution. Another blessing to persecution is that as we are persecuted, our faith is purified. We grow in our faith. We sometimes need a bit of that pressure to help us to grow. And persecution does that. Struggles do that. So we mustn't be surprised when we suffer persecution. Because those who live righteously will suffer persecution. But let us not be persecuted for living unrighteously. But let us be willing to face persecution for righteousness' sake. It's about having a godly character. It's about longing for Him. That's what the Beatitudes are all about. It's not about some physical manifesto or what we have to do. It's about a heart that longs to know Christ and have Him at the center. But not just a godly character, but also godly conduct, which we see from verse 13 to 16. 
A godly character comes from Christ, and then from that godly character, it births godly conduct, all coming from Christ. Jesus said that we must be salt and we must be light. That's how we must conduct ourselves in this world. Why salt? Well, salt is a preservative. It stops decay. It stops something from decaying. Also, salt helps with a flavor, being a flavor enhancer. It helps with taste. So salt is both a preservative and helps with taste. And what's important is that that is our role as Christians, to stand against the evil of this world by declaring the righteousness of God. We hold back the decay. The Holy Spirit that lives within us and works in us stops the decay from setting in through our very presence here on earth. But also we are there to share and live the gospel, to draw people to Christ. God has chosen to use us in the message. He has chosen to send us out. See, salt from the Dead Sea was not always pure. The salt they used 2,000 years ago was often mixed with other materials and would often lose its saltiness or effectiveness. So as we have to be this preservative and this flavor enhancer, so we have to be careful that we don't lose our saltiness. As Jesus said, if the salt loses its flavor, how will it be seasoned? But then it must be thrown outside on the road and fall between the cracks of the bricks to just kill the weeds. It doesn't have a purpose of being salt. So for us as Christians, we have to be careful that we don't mix with the world. That the world does not come into the church and the church doesn't become like the world. And we ourselves as Christians are not consumed by the world. Because when we are consumed by the world, we lose our saltiness. We lose our effectiveness. So we must shun the world and be that salt. But also be light. And what does light do? Light shows something. It manifests something. So we are the light of the world. God has chosen to use us as light. Why? Because we show God to the world. In and through the believer's life, God is manifested because we represent Him. And because we're representing Him, through our lives, He's manifested in the world. Also through our preaching, through declaring the Word, God is shown to the world. And people are drawn to the light. In John chapter 3 it says that there are many who will prefer the darkness and not want the light, but there are those who want the light. And those that God is calling and drawing, it's our responsibility to shine that light so that they are drawn to the light. So we have to live in this world as salt and as light, pointing people to Christ, pointing them to the Saviour. And therefore, works are important as a testimony. Works are vital to lead people to Christ in being salt and light. It's not about being a, a goody two-shoes and trying to do good things the whole time, but it is through our lives and character and conduct that we draw people to Christ. We're not saved by our works. We can never be saved by our works. We are saved by grace alone, but our works are there to point others to Christ and manifest Him in this world. And that's very, very important. So we must be those representatives of Christ by showing godly conduct. And then finally, not just a godly character or godly conduct, but a godly contrast. And that is from verse 17 to 20. And I believe it's a very important part of the passage and the crux of the passage. That what Jesus Christ was doing in the Sermon on the Mount was drawing a contrast between the Pharisees and himself. He was drawing a clear distinction between religious works and truly serving God. What was the standard and expectation of the law? The standards were high. The expectation was great under the law. And Jesus Christ pointed this out often. He spoke about this. What must a man do? It's very serious. I mean, we do all these things, and how can we ever be good enough? That's the point. Because the bar was set so high that no one could reach that level, and God knew that. 
The point of the Old Testament law was not to save man, but to point him to God and to point him to Christ and to point him to the Savior. In the Old Testament, they were always just saved through the sacrifice. They were never saved by following the law. The law always pointed to Christ. It was a shadow of what was to come, because in Christ there is hope. And Jesus Christ, in Matthew 5, draws that clear distinction. Because the Pharisees believed that they lived a righteous standard. They focused on the law and added other things into it and made themselves look very holy and spiritual. Other people felt very insecure when they looked at the Pharisees. But the Pharisees would interpret the law the way they, the way they wanted to interpret it. They interpreted it focusing on what they wanted and adding things to it. They had moved so far away from what the Lord truly said. But Christ taught what the law actually said. It was about the heart. It was about the heart that wanted to serve God. The heart that worshipped God and not just following laws, but truly focusing on who God is. And that's why Jesus Christ came. Jesus Christ came as the manifestation of God, as the second person of Trinity, to draw men and women to himself, the true worshippers, not those who wanted to follow the Pharisees' doctrine of just doing religious things, but truly wanting to worship God. So as we consider Matthew 5, 6, and 7 as a Sermon on the Mount, it is very clear that the Lord is speaking out against false religious thoughts and legalistic thinking. And this is highlighted to us in Matthew chapter 23. So it seems that there's this great contrast between the Pharisees and Christ and, and Matthew 5, 6, and 7 and Matthew 23. Certain things are mentioned in Matthew 5 that link in with Matthew chapter 23. In Matthew 5, 23 to 24, the Lord speaks about the altar, that if you're taking a gift to the altar, or to the temple, if you're taking a gift in, and you have an issue with your brother, rather leave the gift there and go to your brother first and deal with that and then come back and make an offering. So deal with your heart. Don't just go through a religious process of making an offering or bringing a gift, but sort out those things in your life. And we see the same in Matthew 23, where Jesus Christ speaks out against the Pharisees, saying that they've used the altars, they've used the gifts for gain. That they use those religious things to gain something, not worried about the principle behind it. Also, when Jesus Christ speaks about the persecution in Matthew 5, who's he referring to? He's referring to the Pharisees. They are the ones who persecuted God's people. They were the greatest threat to the believers at the time because they wanted to destroy and crush Christ and persecute his people. In Acts chapter 4, who are the ones who are persecuting the apostles? It is the Pharisees. And therefore Jesus Christ was highlighting who they are and how evil they actually were. And how true believers needed to move away from just legalism, but truly serving God. I want to take that reading from Matthew 23. So I read from Matthew chapter 23, verse 23 to 31. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you cleanse the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the, of the cup and the dish, that the outside then may be clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, 
because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have partaken, be partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore you are witnesses against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt, serpents, brood of vipers. How can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore indeed I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in the synagogues and persecute from city to city. That on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechai, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. So Jesus Christ was pointing out the evil of religious structures, the evil of the religious structures of the Pharisees that added to what God's word had said, and that they themselves are the ones who undermined God. And the true believers needed to turn to God and turn from the evil leaven of the Pharisees' doctrine. So in conclusion, what is the blessing to us as God's people? How can we be blessed? It's a blessing for us to know that the Christian life is not about us. It's not about our goodness. It's not about our strength. It's not about our righteousness. The blessing is to know that it is about Christ, His goodness, His strength, His righteousness. It's about Christ. And his work that was accomplished on the cross. His finished work that was accomplished for us. And what is important is that that work was finished. It is finished. But it's not just a past work. It's a present work and a future work. Because Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the Father. Continuously making intercessions for us. That I can know with full assurance. That Jesus Christ has paid the price and is pleading my case. That there is no sin that he cannot forgive. That I am in him. And that brings security to my heart. That brings blessing to my heart. That brings joy to our lives to know that it is about Christ and him being perfect. It's about him and what he has done. And that is why Matthew chapter 5 is so important, because Jesus Christ is highlighting the fact that it is in Him. And those that long for Him, those who want to be in Him, that is where the blessing is found. So may we take comfort from that as God's people, that it is about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's Him we share, it's Him we live for, and it's in Him that we find our blessing. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for your grace and we thank you for your mercy and we thank you, Lord, for your word to us now. We pray that we will hear your word, we pray that you'll help us to apply your word in our lives and we will truly experience that blessing of being in you. That it is about you, Lord, it's not about us. Help us to steer clear of everything that we do that is only for superficial religious purposes, but help us to get to the real core issue of the heart of worshipping you. Help us to worship you, Lord, in spirit and in truth. Lord, we hold on to you. You are our source, and we thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us, and help us to worship you, Lord, as we commit ourselves to you. In your wonderful name we pray, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very much for joining us. We trust that you were blessed and inspired by God's word. Our final song is a beautiful song. O oh Lord, my rock and redeemer. May you be blessed and inspired by this song. Have a wonderful week and join us again as we continue next week in our series on the Gospel of Matthew. Have a blessed week.